Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Mike Burden. He's a consultant ophthalmologist uh, with an interest in neuro-ophthalmology at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham. Uh, Mike took over as president of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists in May 2017, and uh, we've just had an excellent session next door. Uh, many of you uh, attended. So Mike, uh, this session is talking on worldwide causes of blindness. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. I'm sorry that the previous the, our speaker uh, broke his ankle, I gather. Couldn't maybe, uh, all I know about altitude uh, ophthalmology is it is actually quite thin at the top of, the air is quite thin at the top of Kilimanjaro, and that uh, astronauts get a path edema light change in their uh, eyes that makes NASA worried that they may not be able to send somebody to Mars after all. Um, so I'm going to focus on something that I've got a lot of interest in, and I would encourage you to have uh, an interest in because I would estimate that at least half the audience will have both cataracts done before they die, and probably the majority of you will see an eye doctor at some stage. Now, it gives me great pleasure to be here, because I think uh, dermatologists and ophthalmologists have a lot in common. Um, I personally believe that we do an industrial scale job for the NHS, seeing patients in our outpatients on a daily basis. I think like um, ophthalmologists, Patients, uh, like their eyes, patients take their skin for granted. They certainly take their sight for granted, but I suspect the same is true for you, that when they lose their sight, they really miss it. Um, so I think we need to actually uh, push our, our subspecialty forward in the priority within the NHS. Uh, and this is just a, a bit of a reflection on uh, my experiences both locally, I have a department-to-department -department link between our hospital and a hospital in Tanzania, and I helped set up a college-to-college uh, -college link with now 11 countries in East Africa, the College of Ophthalmology of East, South, Central Africa. Um, and I'm also throwing in uh, some of the issues that I've identified as two years of president of my college. So let's see if we can get this to work. Um, those are my declarations. Um, I'm going to just talk a bit about the epidemiology and impact of, cat of visual impairment. I'm going to talk about cataract surgery because as an example of, of the developments and the changes and challenges in ophthalmology. By the way, we've been inventing precision surgery for a very long time in ophthalmology, as you will see. And then I'm going to talk about the challenges of meeting the demands of 350 to 400,000 cataract operations per year in the NHS, particularly uh, in a time of CCGs. So, um, first of all, I'd just like to remind you of the classification of visual impairment. Um, you're all familiar with the Snell and Chant. Hopefully this projects. This is the 6-6 six, six line, the normal vision line. Somewhere around here is your driving vision cutoff. The international classification diseases, you've got um, uh, mild impairment there. Uh, moderate impairment, uh, you can't see better than this, uh, but you actually only have severe vision loss if you can't even see the top letter at the, uh, the, uh, the six meters, and you're registered blind if you have to take uh, half the distance you would normally have to see uh, to, to, to see the top letter. So actually, our definitions of impairment, and particularly the severe impairment, is really very severe in, in the context of the demands of vision these days. Um, in terms of the number of people in the world affected by um, visual impairment, of the 7.33 billion people alive in 2015, um, 36 million were blind, and you can see the numbers increasing uh, for moderate and, and mild, but crucially, and uh, those of you who have reached a certain age like I have, don't really under, uh, will recognize this. If you haven't, you don't understand the significance. Presbyopia, the inability to maintain close focus, which kicks in around about 45, is a significant curse, particularly if you are in a country that can't provide you with glasses. And there is one billion people whose vision is compromised by their inability to get reading glasses. If you look at the age standardized pre prevalence of uh, moderate or severe vision impairment, the good news, I'll, I'll show some details in a second, but if you just look at all these graphs, which are showing causes and regions, 
every one of them is sloping downward. So I think that's from 2009, I think it is. Um, so 1999 to 2020 projected, all the slopes are going downwards, which is really encouraging. We are making a difference to the magnitude of visual impairment in the world and the prevalence is going down. And if you look at the causes, the usual suspects, uh, over half is uncorrected refractive error. If we get the glasses out there, we'd make a big difference. Then there's cataracts. And what's interesting is that, um, and we'll come back to a second in another slide, I think, uh, things like, we used to think of as, as major issues like trachoma are actually starting to be cured. River blindness is now seriously under control thanks to ivern ivermectin. Um, and the big uh, issues are glasses, cataract, glaucoma, and increasingly age-related macular degeneration. Fortunately, diabetic retinopathy in the uh, first world is also much better managed these days. But if we compare Western Europe with Eastern uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, which is where I tend to do my overseas work, you can see there's a significant increase in, in the prevalence. Um, you can see the trachoma, the purple, has really started to come down, but we are left with cataracts and glasses as the major causes of, of uh, visual impairment in the world. Now, our challenge, however, is, is illustrated here. The blindness, moderate and severe impairment, and even mild, it just gets worse and worse the older you get. And unfortunately, the world's population is getting older and older. So eye departments are getting busier and busier. Um, and for that reason, although the actual prevalence has gone down, the actual numbers of people blind or severely impaired or moderately severely impaired has actually gone up uh, from 1990 to 2015. So despite all our efforts, we're seeing another 5.4 million people blind because of population growth and aging, um, which is counteracting our ability to treat. And a similar for moderate and severe visual impairment, 56 million more people in that category. So our efforts globally to deal with blindness and visual impairment is it, we are still struggling. And actually, the projected figures look really poor indeed. Um, essentially, what's also interesting is, despite all our work, the amount of that blindness and visual impairment that is treatable, 80%, uh, has not changed very much over the last 10 years. And if you could cure uh, cataract or uncorrected refractive error, you would get rid of 77% of visual impairment and 55% of blindness within the world. And actually, both are eminently treatable. The interesting thing about visual impairment is that we're all used to thinking of that blind person. And in Africa, you think of that person being led by uh, a stick by their grandchild. It's a very emotive uh, illustration of the impact of blindness. But actually, I think this paper by colleagues of mine, Jagni Rahi and her team in London, uh, published a couple of years ago, hasn't reached the, uh, the impact it should have done. This is part of the UK Biobank study, and they basically were able to look at the vision and a whole lot of other metrics related to over 100,000 people between 40 and 73, slight majority uh, women. And what they did was they subcategorized the milder forms of vision impairment into, uh, into groups and got down only to socially significant visual acuities when the better eye could only see somewhere between 612 and 618, in other words, now on the wrong side of driving. So this lot wouldn't even be considered as socially significant visual impairment. But there's a lot of people in those groups. And going from a standard reference range of bilaterally normal vision down through these mild changes that most people wouldn't even recognize as being a problem, you can detect influence of their visual impairment on their unemployment status, their occupational status, their housing status, their earnings, uh, their general health scores, their mental health scores, and their need for disability attendance allowance. So what you've got to bear in mind is that the blind and severely vision impaired that you will think about is the tip of an iceberg that vision really does matter in a vision-dominated society. So your eyesight really does matter. 
Now, I'm going to use cataract surgery as an illustration of where I think we have actually done a lot. And I apologize, one or two of you may find some of the subsequent videos a little bit squeamish. I certainly do. So the basic aim of the game for cataract surgery is to take the cataract out from within the eye. It comes in its own bag, the basement membrane, bag full of epithelial cells attached to the side walls of the eye by zonules. And we've been doing this operation for years. This is couching. Been done for 4,000 years. You stick a knife, uh, 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 a sharpened bit of wood, I think this was, into the eye, and you wiggle around, and you poke the lens into the back of the eye, and you add saliva as the antiseptic, and then you use the patient's uh, scarf to wipe up what you've done. Okay? Now, um, that's slightly distressing, particularly as that video was not 4,000 years old. That was being done in the 1970s. This is done in the 1930s, and I find that quite squeamish as well. They're basically sawing away halfway through the cornea and pressing on the eye and getting the, the, the cataract out. And for those of you who are really working at what's going on, they're using the same incision to cut not only the cornea, but actually the front, the, 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 the top off the lens. Um, and this is remarkable for a number of reasons. One, it's been videoed. And two, it's been done under local anaesthetic. And every time I see this, I wince. But actually, this was sort of surgery was being done in the 1960s uh, as a routine for our cataract surgery. And since then, we've got a lot better. One of the problems with that sort of surgery is that we were taking out a lens and patients used to walk around with the replacement lenses that look like that. That's actually my wife. She hasn't had a cataract done, but she's long and suffering. And you'll see her in all the books I write, demonstrating all sorts of things. These are aphakic glasses, um, which replace the power of the lens in your eye. But if you took those off, you were actually functionally blind because you needed the focusing power of those lenses to see. And then along came, hopefully we'll see in a second, this man, Harold Ridley, who put the first intraocular lens in. And we are a pretty conservative bunch. When he first did this, he got absolutely caned for doing so. Um, people wanting him to be struck off. But actually, this visionary man has now led to millions and millions and millions of, of, of successful operations. The problem he had was that the technology when he started doing it wasn't good enough. But this is where we've gone from 1929 to 1949. He was now able to put stitches in to at least close the wound. I don't know if you noticed, those that operation I showed you, they had a, a, a cut in the eye, but no way of, of suturing it. What he's doing is he's pre-placing sutures. Again, uh, a major development, but we would say that those sutures are very crude 5.0 silk sutures. We would never contemplate doing this anymore with them. You then get the same very uncomfortable looking blade going straight across the cornea, 180 degree incision, aiming to get between the, the, the sutures that you put in so that you can use them afterwards. And then he goes in with forceps and just grabs the anterior capsule and tears it away, um, hoping that the posterior capsule is still intact. Then you press on the eye at the bottom and hopefully the lens pops out. And there it goes. Then you wash out the, the sort of soft lens matter that remains. And you've got a, a posterior capsule into which you put this lens. 13 millimeter diameter, you drop it, you pick it up because you, can't, you haven't got a spare. And then you put it in. This is cutting edge science from 1949. And what you do then is, because you're not sure it's in the right place, you use your cornea to push it in place. Because you don't know that the corneal endothelium is the only thing that's stopping you from getting a waterlogged cornea. Um, but that was the first, uh, well, that wasn't the first. They didn't do it with the video the first time. But within a few months of the first operation, uh, where a lens was, was put in, and that is a landmark video. Um, let's see if I can stop that now. I've just borrowed this off YouTube because I never video my own cataract surgery, and it's always quite fun to pick holes in other people's. Um, this is being done through a 3.75 millimeter incision. 
I actually use a 3.8. That's the sort of precision we use. What he's doing here on an American cataract, because you can actually see clearly what's going on, is uh, tearing a circular hole in the anterior capsule. He's then going to squirt fluid between the capsule and the lens to loosen it. And he's now got a lens within, that is now loose within the eye. Then he's using an instrument called a phaco emulsifier in, invented by uh, uh, Kalman in, in uh, 1970s. And again, it took a long time to perfect the technology to allow us to do this safely. What's happening is this tube is actually vibrating very fast from side to side. It's hollow and it sucks things up as well. And around it, there's a sleeve putting fluid into the eye all the time. And this is basically, he's using a second instrument to help chop up the cataract into small bits. And this phaco emulsifier is breaking it up into small bits. And this chap, I think, is pretty good at his job. There are some amazing videos of which I would never dare put up on the YouTube. Um, and he is helped by the fact that this is pretty well the easiest cataract you can do. Um, you do have some fine remnants left, and you change your instrument to, do, to suck those out. And I've done about five or 6,000 cataract operations, and the reason I like doing them is partly because of the impact they have, but also because uh, when you've got a patient whose pupil doesn't dilate, who's got Parkinson's disease, whose head is moving under the microscope, who's too ill for a, for, uh, a general anesthetic, it actually changes the operation from being relatively straightforward to at least much more sporting. So, um, but the technology we have these days is hugely different. It means that we can now do cataract surgery. In the old days, you did cataract surgery when you were blind because there was a strong risk of blindness and therefore you took the risk because you're already blind. These days, we can offer, as you'll see, cataract surgery at a much earlier stage. Now, with a bit of luck, what we're going to see next is him putting in our new style of lens, bearing in mind this is a less than four millimeter incision, and he is going to inject a lens into the eye that, as you will see, uh, unfolds in the eye. And I think this is seriously uh, a major technology. The only downside is that we now make cataract surgery look so easy that patients don't believe there can be any risks at all to it. So that's the lens being injected. And what happens next is it gradually, it's an acrylic lens, it unfolds. And what we've learned is you don't need a 13 millimeter lens, about a seven, six or seven millimeter lens, plus legs to hold it in place, all you need when the pupil's down to its normal size. So what's happening now is those, lenses, th those legs are gradually unfolding, the lens is held in the same bag the cataract came out of, and he's just removing the thick liquid that we used for the, uh, to help us do the operation. And essentially, phaco emulsification has become the way we do our cataract surgery. This is a, a curve showing the uptake. The Brits were slightly behind, but nowadays, 99 plus percent of cataract surgery is done with phaco emulsifier. And it's not only an aim to restore the vision. We now choose a lens and where we operate, how we operate to minimize your need for glasses. We have lenses that can correct astigmatism, presbyopia. We do it under topical anesthesia. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes to do. And the risks have come down to about a one in a thousand chance of you losing a sight and one in a hundred chance of requiring more than one operation. C profoundly different to when, we, uh, when I started doing uh, my eye training about 25, 30 years ago. The problem is, we do it on a very large scale. And these are figures that basically show that over time, because of the aging population, the number of cataracts needing to be done is going up and up all the time. And we did, I think, in the UK, about 400,000 last year. What we can do, and I think this is one of the amazing developments that ophthalmologists have done, that I've persuaded Matt Hancock that we can actually do, he, wasn't, he couldn't believe we could do it, is that we now use electronic patient records to document what we do. And in the cataract pathway, we, which is down here where the GP or optometrist refers, the hospital does the treatment and the optometrist often does the post-op, we can suck all that data in, analyze it, and give uh, a national ophthalmology database analysis and audit of, well, I believe now, 1.1 million cataracts, which makes us, I think, by a large margin, one of the biggest databases in any health center. Um, 
It came from a bunch of enthusiasts, including a chap called Rob Johnson, unfortunately died of squamous cell, uh, of, uh, of, of a parotid tumor, one of his many tumors accumulated, unfortunately. Um, it was an enthusiastic bunch started about uh, 15, 20 years ago, who did 16,000 uh, audit. And this was hailed by an American ophthalmologist as being revolutionary. I'm not quite sure what he think now, but he got up to 1.1 million. But basically, it was revolutionary because of the ease of which we could get the data. We just literally sent it down the line, and it was analyzed in one center, in fact, in, in, um, in Cheltenham. And what those early people found is that if you're looking at the risk of losing vision uh, from a cataract operation, if you break the posterior capsule, which is only a hundredth of a millimeter thick, your chances of causing actual visual loss goes up 5.7 times. And for that reason, we now audit our surgeons against that posterior capture rupture data. And we produce a report every year now, and we can tell you by surgeon. So you can go online now and find out how good your surgeon is. This one is pretty good. He has not boasted a, a capsule in the whole year, but he's only done 56 cataract operations. And I don't think that's good enough. And I don't think that's good enough because that's actually me. And when I became president, uh, my not operating time went down considerably. Um, I think we all need to be doing about 200 a year. You can do it by hospital. And we're increasing now recruiting. We're doing most of the hospitals in, uh, in, in, the, in England, and we're increasingly getting some of the private centers on board. One of the key aspects of this huge amount of data is we can now look at a patient and work out how risky their operation is. I don't know how well you can see it, but if you are over 90 years old, there's an increased risk. If you can't lie flat, there's an increased risk. If you've got a dense cataract, diabetic retinopathy, you're very short, very long-sighted, uh, sorry, short-sighted. If you um, uh, have had previous surgery, et cetera, et cetera, we can now calculate risk. So we can tell you, you've got a 0.75% chance of having pressure capture rupture, and you, you've got a 30% chance. And that obviously impacts on who you get to do your operation and that has training implications, but importantly, it has safety implications. And this has now been adopted by, uh, by NICE, basically saying you should be using that data to choose who does the operation and what you tell the patient. It has also led to changes in practice. Um, this was an eye department in the south of England who consistently did badly. After they'd been doing it badly for three years, the surgeons actually persuaded their uh, medical director to buy a microscope that wasn't attached to the roof so every time somebody went up in the lift the thing shook and it's not surprisingly the year later they were now a very good department and when we look at uh, individual surgeons over time our PC rupture rate was 2% in 2010 it's now 1.38 in 2017 the latest one actually is 1.2 and that means that a huge number of patients have not lost vision as a result of the cataract surgery and a lot of money has been saved by the NHS. Um, the issue, of course, is that just when an audit is getting on really well, the NHS stopped funding it. And the biggest challenge I have as president, or one of the biggest challenges I have, is to try and get somebody to say sustainably fund that, because we can use the same methodology to audit our macular degeneration, our glaucoma surgery, and really start to prove that ophthalmology departments are very good. Now, NICE uh, did cataracts in adults, and I know that because I chaired it. And we were asked to do it because of uh, patient safety issues with the wrong lenses, and then we were asked to do it because of a postcode lottery that existed at the time. And the, one of the best bits of work from that thing was a health economic assessment done independently of the ophthalmologist, which basically said cataract surgery is incredibly cost-effective for both the first and second eye. And we recommended that you did not restrict access to cataract surgery on the basis of visual acuity. And we actually say that you should undergo cataract surgery when the patient is aware that his or her quality of life is being limited by his or her vision, and he or she is prepared to take on the risks associated with surgery, and obviously when the surgeon believes that cataract surgery is likely to improve the patient's vision. That is the criteria for referral and performing the surgery. Unfortunately, CCGs who were operating a postcode lottery before that NICE guideline came out are continuing to do so, 
And at the last time it was looked at by some people in the medical technology group called Ration Watch, there are still 104 of the 195 CCGs restricting access. And for some bizarre reason, uh, they call cataract surgery a procedure of limited clinical value. And I can't tell you how insulting that is to the patients around the world with cataracts. And this is a study that recently came out uh, from uh, Gareth in, in the BMJ. He did a freedom of information and uh, request, and he's basically asked the CCGs, how many of you are now requesting prior approval for your cataract surgery? And you can see the numbers are going up. Um, this is the total number done. Now 22% of the cataracts done in the last year require prior approval, 60,000. That is a lot of time being spent doing, can I do the cataract? Yes, you can. And what's bizarre is that when you look at that uh, in, this, in this last time, 70,000 done, only 2,900 were rejected. So they're passing 96% of the requests. And I have to say, my argument there is that what is the point of doing that, of that, way, that time of, of, of paper shuffling if you're only going to reject 4%, particularly when next year their cataracts will have got worse and they will have passed the arbitrary threshold that you put on. So I'm about to meet the NHS CC uh, organization on Thursday and put this data to them strongly and say, will you stop doing this, please, because it's stupid and a waste of, of resources. So what I have learned over my time as an ophthalmologist, and particularly with my work uh, internationally and most recently as president of the college, is obviously, and I am biased perhaps, vision is the most important of our senses. Even relatively small changes in our vision impacts on our health and life chances. And although we are reducing the prevalence, the number of absolute number of people visually impaired is increasing because of visual, uh, increasing population aging. And 80% of visual impairment is treatable or preventable. Cataract surgery itself is safe and effective, but there is still a persisting unjustified postcode lottery for the operation, which, unless we can change it in the near future, may well affect quite a large number of you in the audience. So I think that's it. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, you've certainly opened our eyes to um, oh, all these global issues. And yep. I think we face similar challenges across dermatology in terms sure. of standards, practice, audit, data. Uh, and uh, thank you once again for speaking uh, in this session. I've got a number of things to uh, give you, including a scroll.